Join the celebration of God's goodness, standing together in faith. Be constantly, he said, engaging in the contest of faith. Your faith ought to be on something all the time. Now is the time for purpose and destiny to meet in the unfolding of God's vision for the earth. You are the number one candidate in the earth today that all of heaven is waiting for. Your hosts, Drs. Andre and Jenny Raybert. Say after me, faith always makes a way. Always makes a way. Say, that's how we did it. That's how. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory, glory, glory. Are you ready for the word of the Lord tonight? Are you ready? Come on, I, I need to know. Are you really ready? Who's about to leave this place changed by faith? Come on. Who's about to get healed in this place tonight? Let me see. Who's about to get delivered tonight? Let me see. Come on. Who's about to step into all that God has for you in prosperity? Come on. Let me see. The Word of God is how He did it. The message of faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, while you're on your feet, put your hands together. Welcome my good friend, Pastor Jeremy Pearsons, right now to bless each and every one of us. God bless you. Bless you, man. Love you, sir. Praise the Lord. While you're standing up, let's pray together and we'll get right into the Word tonight. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We glorify you. Lord, there is no one like you. We magnify the name of the Lord Jesus tonight. You are a name above every name, and we lift you up. We set our eyes on you. We take our eyes off each other. We take our eyes off of things going on around us. And we set our eyes on you, Lord. I'm reminded in your word, when people said they didn't know what to do, yet they looked at you. And as long as we know to look at you, we know what to do. Father, we set our eyes on you tonight. We come before your word with open eyes, open ears, open hearts. We want eyes that see Jesus hear his voice and understand who we are in him and who he is in us and we thank you lord for the change that's going to take place in our lives tonight because of the anointing that's on your word and this is your word ministered by your grace your help your spirit to your people under your anointing lord this is on you and we look to you and we thank you for doing what only you can do we give you praise in jesus name amen you may be seated. It's a blessing to be, be with you again tonight. Dr. Andre, Jenny, thank you guys. Thank you both so much. What a thrill. What an honor. If you brought a Bible with you tonight and you're here in the studio, I want you to open them with me once again to the book of Romans. And you can find chapter 10. If you're watching tonight at home, in your office, uh, in your car, pull over and watch. Uh, I don't condone watching and driving, but whatever you got to do, man, to get the Word of God into your life, do that, because that's where change begins, is with the Word of God coming into your heart, coming into your eyes, your ears, getting down on the inside of you, and then as we're going to see tonight, once the Word gets in you, then it can come out of you, and that's when change happens in your life. So wherever you are watching this tonight, number one, thank you. Thank you for putting God first. And he said in his word, those who honor me, I will honor. And you honor God by giving him your time, your affection, your attention. And he's about to honor you by meeting every need you have, by restoring your health, restoring your family. He is just that good. So if you can, get a Bible with you. We're going to get right into the word tonight. You find Romans chapter 10. And while you're looking for Romans 10, let me remind you of something we read in Romans chapter 4 last night, talking about the life of Abraham. In verse 19, it says that Abraham was not weak in faith. He did not consider his own body. Let me stop right there. You know, that's what weak faith does. Weak faith considers your body. Weak faith takes into consideration what you see, what you feel. That's what weak faith does does. But Abraham says he was not weak in faith because he did not consider his own body. Now how many of you know he had a lot to consider with his own body? What was up with his body? It was old. That's what was up with that body. It was old. And his wife's body, what was wrong with it? Old. 
just old, man. That's all there was to it. And if he had taken time to stop and consider his body, her body, and the impossibleness of the situation, his faith would have been weak. It says he didn't consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. What is wavering? That's up one day, down the next. That's one step forward, two steps back. Wavering, wavering, no consistency. God's looking for some consistency out of us. You know, that's a, one of the marks of a mature believer. Consistent. The same, the same, the same. No matter what you throw at them, no matter what comes their way, they're just the same. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but here it comes, but was strengthened, praise God, strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Do you want to know what gives God more glory, even more than you just saying glory to God, glory to God, glory to God? That's a good start, I guess. But what actually gives him glory is you and me being strong in faith, especially when there's no rational reason to be strong in faith. That gives him glory. And this part that you're living in, the unseen part, the part where you're believing God and you believe you have it before you see it, can I tell you something about God? That's his favorite part. Now, I know it's not your favorite part. Your favorite part is when faith becomes sight. And that's our favorite part. That's the part we shout about. But God, his favorite part is when you believe in and don't see it. Oh, he loves it. He loves it. He loves it. Because it's faith and it's what pleases him. It's like, it's like kids at Christmas. Your favorite part as the parent is the anticipation, right? Your favorite part is having the gift wrapped up under the tree for a few days, a few weeks maybe before Christmas morning and the kid just walking past it day after day after day after day, looking at it, trying to figure it out, shaking it, putting an ear to it, see if it's barking, just looking for some kind of clue what's in here. It's the anticipation. And as parents, man, we love the excitement, the anticipation. Watch this now. The expectation of what's coming. Kids, their favorite part is the unwrapping of it and seeing it. But have you ever noticed, even with kids, how quickly the excitement of that goes away? There's nothing more frustrating as a parent when you watch your child on Christmas morning not playing with the toy you got them, but the box it came in. <laughs> you think to yourself, why didn't I just buy you a box, man? If you love it this much, I can get you a hundred of these. No, the, the anticipation is the exciting part. And God's question is, can you still expect, even when you don't see? Man, you can shout amen in the house of God, and you can say, I'm expecting, you can, see my, you can sing, I'm expecting, you can do all that stuff on a Sunday, but can you wake up Monday still believing? This is what the scripture says. It says, we inherit the promise, how? By faith, and, who remembers? Patience. Faith and patience. Now, I realize I lost a whole bunch of you right then, but stay with me. It's not just faith, it's faith and patience. That's how we were told Abraham received. Faith, just make it simple for you. Faith is believing. Patience is continuing to believe. That's what patience is. It's often translated endurance. Can you stay with this thing? How much endurance do you have? This is a huge part of our spiritual fitness, not just our strength, but our endurance. Abraham was strong in faith. A, a huge part of that strength was proven by his ability not just to believe, but to keep believing and keep believing and keep believing and he didn't see it on Monday and he didn't see it next week and he didn't see it next month and he didn't see it for year after year after year and yet he kept believing. 
And he was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. In verse 21, this is what we shouted about last night. Being what? Fully persuaded. Not almost there, not halfway there, all the way there. Can I get a little help from somebody in here tonight? Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? I feel like maybe this section over here is just like right on the edge with me. You could just, you could get excited. I feel like you could just break out any moment now. I'm, I'm, I'm counting on you. Okay, all right. Fake it till you make it. That's fine. But Abraham got to the point where he was fully all the way there, totally persuaded. You know, when you're fully persuaded, that's the moment you can't be talked out of this stuff anymore. Now, until you get to that point, until you get there, the Word of God is just something you heard before. And we're going to see this tonight in Scripture, but you got to be watchful over the Word of God just being something that you heard. And somebody stands behind a pulpit under the anointing and opens the Word and preaches to you, and you sit there and say, man, I heard this before. Come on, faith again? We've heard this. I've heard this before. I've heard this before. I've heard this before. Yeah, well, as long as the Word of God remains something you've just heard, you can still be talked out of it. Because this is what Satan comes to do, is tell you something else. And now what are you going to do? You've got what you heard God say, and now you've got what you heard Satan say. You've got what God says about your healing, but now you've got this other thing that the, do the doctor handed you, and this is your diagnosis. Now you've heard two things. Which one are you going to go with? And as long as this report from God that said, by, your, by his stripes you were healed, as long as this report is just something you heard, you can be talked out of it by this thing. But when you get to the place where his word crosses over that line from something you've heard to something you know, and you are fully persuaded, you are fully convinced, now you can't be talked out of it. And let the diagnosis come. Let them say what they want to say. Let the problems come. And you stand there and you look at it and you say, yeah, but I believe the report of the Lord and I will not be talked out of what he said. You're, pers you're persuaded. You are fully persuaded. And this is the point Abraham came to being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Did you find Romans chapter 10? We left off here last night. Let's look at it again together. Look at verse 1. Paul writing said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, the nation of Israel, these people, is that they may be saved. Now he goes on in Romans chapter 10, some hugely famous scripture in here that we've all heard, but it's in the context of his desire for these people to be saved. And he said, this is how they're going to be saved, them and anybody else. Verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich. Somebody say rich. Rich. He's rich to all who call upon him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what he's saying is the same thing that saved you will save the guy next to you, will save the person in America, will save the person in the United Kingdom, will save the person in Africa, in Asia, any place all over the world. Why? Because God's rich, man. He's so rich. He has got more than enough of this salvation to go around. It wasn't limited to one people group. This is why you got to laugh when people label something an American gospel. Hey, here's some news. God's not American. You probably knew that. I'm saying that to many Americans watching tonight. God's not American. This is, this is good news for everybody. He's so rich. He is so rich that there's more than enough of this to save you, 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 and me, and all Seven billion of us that are on this planet right now. That's how rich he is. And the only thing it's going to require is you getting something in your heart 
and letting that something come out of your mouth. Those are the two things that it takes. Believing, believing it in your heart, saying it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart, say it with your mouth, and you will be saved. Now let me ask you something. If there's enough power in you believing this and saying this, if there's enough power in that to save you, does it stand to reason that there's enough power in it to heal you? Is that possible? See, we think of these things like healing and abundance and the provision of everything that we need. We think of these things as big things and salvation was just, you know, something small. No, 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 listen to me. Salvation is the biggest thing that's ever happened to anyone, ever. That's the greatest miracle that's ever taken place and it's still taking place by the minute all over the world. This is the biggest thing. Somebody's eternal destination being changed from hell to heaven and the invitation to the presence of God filling up their lives. It doesn't get any bigger than that. This thing is so big that little stuff like healing from cancer just swallowed up in it. Little things like getting you out of debt, it's just swallowed up in the bigness of what's happened for us in Jesus. And whatever truth you were born again by is truth that you live by. So if believing and speaking was the truth that you were born again by, then believing and speaking is the truth you live by. If it was powerful enough to save you on the inside, it's more than powerful enough to change you on the outside. But it requires believing it and saying it, speaking it. That's why we talked about last night how God is waiting on you to say something. This goes on. Listen to this. Verse 14. Well, back up. Verse 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So in other words, you're not going to call God God unless you believe he's God. You'd be lying. You'd be a hypocrite. But the moment that, for lack of a better expression, the moment that truth bomb went off on the inside of you and you saw it, God is God. You saw it and you said it. You couldn't have said it until you believed it. How can they call on him whom they haven't believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Here's what you got to understand about faith. Talking about believing, he's talking about faith. Faith is simply a response. It's just a response. I want you to think about it like we talked about it last night. I want you to get into this conversation with God. Our whole lives are meant to be lived in this ongoing conversation back and forth between God and us. Grace speaking to us, faith speaking to him. Grace said, I love you, I've redeemed you. If you respond to it in faith, you're born again. What else has grace said? I love you, I've healed you. What else has grace said? I love you, therefore I prosper you. I love you, therefore I restore you. I restore your body. I restore your family. I restore everything that concerns you. I love you, so I do this for you. This is grace speaking to you. Now, the only appropriate response to grace is faith. Let me tell you what is not a right response. You don't respond to God when he says, I love you, so I've saved you. You don't respond like this, I'm so unworthy, I'm so unworthy, I'm so unworthy. That's not faith. Can I tell you something? When you start going on and on with this unworthiness trash, you're speaking some other language. And he doesn't speak that language. Can I say it again? God does not speak that language. God doesn't speak doubt. Now, when you're speaking doubt, you speak in some language he doesn't understand. But God doesn't speak that language. God does not speak unbelief. And you start going on and on and on about what you don't have and how you don't feel and what you wish you did have and is it ever going to come and I wish and I wish and I wish. You speak in some language that God himself does not speak and you are not in conversation with him. If all you're doing is talking about the problem, talking about the symptoms, talking about the feelings, Man, you're talking to somebody else. 
And yet people are saying these things thinking they're talking to God. God doesn't speak beggar. That's not his language. That's not his language. You know, I come from a part of the United States, the southern part of the United States in Texas. And in that region of our country and, and really further into the country, we have a very strong and growing Hispanic population. A lot of Spanish-speaking people. A lot of Spanish-speaking people in our state, the state surrounding us. Huge uh, Spanish-speaking population, which means when I sit down to watch television, it comes as no shock or surprise. If I'm flipping through the channels, I'm bound to come across some Spanish-speaking TV stations. Now, here's the problem with that. I don't speak Spanish. So you know what does me no good when I come across that channel? Turning it up. That doesn't help me. And I don't know if people who speak other languages have the same problem that English-speaking people do. We come across somebody who doesn't speak our language. If I'm talking to a Spanish person and I say something in English, they, they would respond like this, no habla ingles, no habla. Can you try that, no habla? You're familiar with that expression, no habla. That's a Spanish for I don't speak whatever it is you're speaking. I don't speak Spanish. And there's a problem that we English-speaking people have that when we come across somebody who speaks another language, like I'm talking to some guy who speaks Spanish and he says no habla ingles, you know what I do as an English person? I try speaking louder to him and saying, do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? Listen to me, white people, it doesn't help to turn it up. We think that somehow cranking up the volume on a language they don't speak is going to help them understand. It doesn't help. That's foolish though, isn't it? It's foolish to think that that would do the trick. How much more idiotic and foolish is it to think that since God's not answering our begging and our pleading and our crying, let's beg louder. Let's cry harder. Let's plead louder. Jesus was real plain about it. He said, don't pray like this. Don't pray like people who think they will be heard for their much speaking. There are a lot of people who think they're talking to God and God just standing there going, uh, no habla doubt. I'm sorry, no habla worry, no habla fear. Are you hearing me tonight? If I'm going to get anything done, anything accomplished with somebody, with another person, at some point, we're going to have to start speaking the same language. How much more true with God? You want to get anything done with him and you want him to get anything done with you, at some point, you're going to have to start speaking his same language language. You're going to have to get into a conversation with him and respond not to the symptoms, respond to what he's saying. Respond not to what things look like, not what things feel like. That's where people are living their entire lives, right here in constant conversation with the problem. This is what it feels like. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. I don't feel good. It doesn't look good. How can this possibly turn out? Folks, you are in conversation with the wrong person. As long as you're responding to this, fear responds to what it sees. Fear responds to how it feels. Fear responds to the symptom. Fear responds to the diagnosis. Faith responds to grace. And when symptoms show up or a diagnosis comes sliding across a doctor's desk to you and they say, you've got months left, you're going to have to make a choice right then. Who am I going to get in conversation with? If I get in a conversation with that piece of paper, it's going to kill me. If I get in a conversation with words written in red, it'll save my life. you got to decide. This goes on, verse 15, well, read 14 again. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how are they going to hear without a preacher? You don't know this, but you need me. Verse 15, how shall they preach unless they are sent. 
As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, Lord, says, Lord, who has believed our report? Here's something you've heard before. I know this, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But this will come as a surprise to you. Did you realize that verse 17 right here that we just read comes right before verse 18? I know that's deep. I know that's real deep for a lot of you, that 17 comes before 18. And here's the thing, those of you who really love studying scripture, it's like that all the way through the Bible. <laughs> the whole thing, 17 always comes before 18. What's my point to you here? Keep reading. Because the whole point was not that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. The rest of the point is, but I say, have they not heard? Remember this whole thing started with, I want these people to be saved. I want them to be saved. And we think so many times that they could just hear the gospel. Who would be bold enough to raise a hand in here tonight or even watching on television and say that you've said that about a loved one, a relative? I just want them to be saved. Anybody? Yes, yeah, see hands everywhere. I just want them to be saved. If they could just hear the gospel. Man, if they could just hear what I heard that saved my life and changed me, if they could just hear, if they could just hear, if they could just hear. But I'm going to tell you something. He says in verse 18, have they not heard? Yeah, he says they have. In other words, the problem isn't with them whether they've heard or not. He says they've heard. So what's the problem? Well, salvation is not totally dependent on what you've heard. It's dependent on your response to what you've heard. It's you responding to it. And those of us in what I call the, the faith camp, and many people refer to it like that, the household of faith, that's a better name for it, this household, this family of faith, if you're like me at all, you grew up in this thing. You've been hearing faith preached. I know we got people, look at me, camera right here, look at me. There are people watching this program right now, and the only reason this show is on is because you've had this network on all day long. It's been running in your house all day. I know you. I know you. I am you. I is you. We is. We are. We're family. I know who you are. I grew up with you. People who just have the word going night and day, night and day. I bet you guys get reports all the time from people who just say it just stays on in my house. Now listen, that's wonderful. I'm not knocking that. That's wonderful. You need that. But, but the problem is people being confused when they've got issues, they've got problems, they've got lack, they've got sickness and it won't go away and they sit there going, I don't understand. I've heard the best word. I've heard everybody preach faith. I've heard Hagen preach faith. I've heard Copeland preach faith. I've heard Savelle preach faith. I've heard Americans preach it, Africans preach it. I've heard British people preach it. I've heard the whole world preach faith. And I don't understand why I still have these problems. Because your healing, like your salvation, is not dependent only on what you've heard. He's waiting on you to, help me out, respond or say something. Say something. And that's why Paul's saying, I wish these people would be saved. The problem's not hearing it. I know they've heard it. And faith came when they heard it. But I'm waiting for them to say something. Say something. Go to the book of Hebrews with me. He's looking for a response. In the book of Hebrews, go to chapter 3. Grace is God speaking to us. Faith is us speaking to him. Grace, to put it simply, says, here you go. And you know what faith says? Thanks. That's, that's really how simple it is. Faith or grace has said to you, here, this is for you. And faith doesn't say, okay, how much does that cost? That's not faith. Faith. That's you trying to work for it. That's you trying to earn it. 
God, I've been to church every time the door was open. I've served. I've been faithful. Why am I the one with this disease? Ah, stop. Why did you go and do those things? Because if you did them in an effort to earn something from God, they were nothing to him. So faith doesn't respond and say, how much does that cost? Faith doesn't respond and say, I'm not worthy of that. Faith doesn't respond like that. That's not faith. You're speaking another language. When grace says, here you go, faith just says, thank you. And faith is expressed with thanksgiving, gratitude, thanking him well before you ever see it. It's a response. And it's one of the first things we teach our children, isn't it? Somebody gives them something, and there we are, mom and dad, standing right over them. What are we quick to say? As soon as somebody hands something to our, one of our kids, what do we say as parents? We look at them and we say, what do you say? What do you say? Come on, what do you say? What are we teaching them to do? Respond. Say something back. It's not okay. If you're a good parent, to you, it's not okay for your kid to be given something by somebody else and them to walk away without saying anything. As a parent, what are you looking for from your child? A response. Say something, baby. And if they don't know what to say, what do you do? You put the words in their mouth. Say thank you. Look them in the eye and say thank you. That's what we do as parents. If you're a good parent, that's what you do. And this is one of the first things we teach our kids to do. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Can't you just hear God saying this to you? Come on, what do you say? And when, you, when your kids revert back to crying, I'm getting a little ahead of myself in here tonight, you're going to see this, but when your kids who are old enough to use words and to use the words that you gave them to use, when they go back to crying and they go back to screaming, back to when they couldn't speak your language to start with, what do you say? No, don't go back to that. Come on, baby. Use your words. Tell me. Use your words. Use your words. And when we go back to crying about how bad it hurts, go back to crying about what we don't have, go back to crying about what we don't see, God's just going, come on, baby. Come on. Use your words. Use, use my words. I put words in your mouth. I want you to speak them. Say them back to me. Say them back to me. And if all you know to say is thank you, you have just stepped up big time in faith. Because if you can be hurting and still thankful, you're a man or a woman of faith. If you can be in pain, in lack, over your head, in debt, and everything falling apart around you, and still look up and through the tears say thank you. I may not have much, but I have Jesus. And if I have you, Jesus, I've got everything I need because everything I need is met in you. So I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. And you just worship him and you thank him. You just worship him and you thank him. You thank him. You thank him. And people around you going, what on earth do you have to be thankful for? And you look back and you say, everything. Everything. Because you're not moved by what you see. You're not moved by what you feel. You walk by faith. It's your response. Grace says, here you go. Faith says, thank you. I receive that. No matter how unworthy you feel of it, just forget all that stuff. You're worthy because he said you are, okay? He said, no, I called you worth it. Don't argue with me about this anymore, God is saying. Man, I just hear the parental voice of God tonight, I guess. God's just looking at us going, come on, don't argue with me about this anymore. I guess I'm just going to have to go with this. I've learned so much about God since I had kids. Some of the best Bible teachers I've ever had are the kids that are growing up in my house. How many of you have ever been involved in a conversation with a child that just seemed to keep going around and around and around because no matter what you said, they came back with this one-word question, just a little three-letter word, Why? 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 Go do this. Why? Why? Go do it like this. Why? Well, because... The, 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 why? And well, okay. And you find yourself trying to have a logical conversation with a three-year-old. 
You've just taken it upon yourself to somehow try to impart information and knowledge. You want them so bad to see and to understand. But as a parent, especially as a mother, I've noticed mothers are more, much more quick to get to this answer than dads are. You do realize there's an answer coming that's going to end this conversation. <laughs> After the 13th why, mama just looks back and says, you want to know why? Help me out, ladies. Because I said so. I heard it from the mother in the house tonight. Because I said so. That's why. What does that answer mean? This conversation is over. And I don't care if you get it. I don't care if it makes sense to you up here or not. You will later. Just go do. Just go obey. Why? Because I said so. I'm going to tell you something. The more you push God with all this unworthiness stuff, I don't feel it. I don't feel worthy of this, all this condemnation. But how could you? How could you do this for me? How could you do this for me? I mean, he's written a whole book on how and why and his motivation and what he did to accomplish it and on and on and on. But if you push him, Far enough in this, you are going to hear the thundering voice of your father rise up inside of you and end this conversation, and he's going to say, you are worthy because I said you were worthy. You push him long enough with this, and you'll hear it. I call you healed, and you are healed because I said you're healed. You just let that roll around in you for a little while. I am what I am because he said I am. I can do what I can do because he said I can do it. Amen. Grace says, here you go. Faith says, thank you. What's he looking for? He's looking for a response. Somebody say response. In the United States, and I know here as well and places all over the world, there's a group of people that we honor in our communities perhaps more than any other. And they're the people we refer to as first responders. Are you familiar with this, this term? Do you have the same thing? It's, it's the police force. It's the, f the firefighters and the ambulance drivers and, and the, the EMTs and the, all of these people that are quick and not just quick, but first responders. We honor these people in our communities because of what they do for us, because of the sacrifice they make for us. And I got to meditating over the last couple of days on what we call them. They're, they're our first responders. They are the ones who were just minding their business, went to work, it was quiet, might have just been standing at the sink, standing at the stove, making some lunch, Maybe they were just sitting over there at a table, a few guys playing cards, a couple guys just laying around over here on their phones, checking email, checking Facebook. And then, out of nowhere, they heard something. Is that right? I mean, what is it going to take to get these guys off the bed and out of the kitchen? It takes a sound. And that's all it takes. We honor these men and these women, because as soon as they hear, they respond. They wouldn't be worthy of our honor if they heard the siren and heard the alarm and said, come on, let's finish our game real quick. They wouldn't be worthy of our honor. They wouldn't be worthy of our honor if they heard the sound and said, oh, my spaghetti's almost done. Just give me a minute. No, they receive our honor because they are first responders. They put their lives, or they put our lives before their own. And they respond to what they've heard. The more I thought about this, the more I realized God loves first responders. He loves it. That's what he loved about Abraham. We talked about it last night. I get the feeling sometimes that he would tell Abraham something to do just to watch him do it. 
He's sitting on the throne. He says, hey, guys, come here. Angels, Jesus. Yeah, everybody, come here. I'm going to show you something. Watch this. You see that guy? That's, his name's Abram. Watch this. Check this out. Abram. Yeah, watch. Just watch. <laughs> yes, God. Change your name. Watch this. Watch this. Okay. Do you see that? He just did it. I just said it, and he just did it. Watch. I'll just tell, I'll tell him anything. Watch this. Watch this one. Um, change your wife's name. You got it. This is amazing. Do you see it? He just responded right away. We talked about everything God asked him to do. And you go back and you look at the account, the Genesis account of Abraham's life, and you hear these things that God required of him. And the scripture tells us on the same day, he went out and did it. And that went all the way up to the point and went from change your name to put your son on the altar. And without hesitation, it says the next morning, God speaks to him in the nighttime, and the next morning he rises. And he says, come on, come on, Isaac, let's go. And they just went. He's a first responder. That's why he's in the book. That's why he is called the father of our faith. Why? He just responded. He just responded. In the book of Hebrews, let's keep moving here, chapter 3, Let's read several verses. Start in verse 7. It says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, who says it? The Holy Spirit says it. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Verse 10 says, therefore I was angry with them. I believe it's the King James Bible that says, I was grieved. Now remember the Holy Spirit saying this. We've come up with a lot of stuff that we assume grieves the Holy Spirit. Oh, don't do that. That grieves the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. That'll grieve the Holy Spirit. Folks, he's not nearly as touchy and sensitive <laughs> as we've made him out to be. He's a lot stronger. He can handle some stuff. I remember being a kid growing up in church. We heard that this other lady pastor who we all loved and admired and respected, we all heard that she said that chewing gum in church grieves the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'll tell you something, man, that just stuck with me. I'm sitting next to somebody in church and they offer me gum. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Afraid that we're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, do you know what grieves the Holy Spirit? Whatever the Bible says grieves the Holy Spirit. That's what grieves the Holy Spirit. And according to the Bible, it's the hardening of your heart after he has spoken, after you've heard something. It says, therefore, I was angry, I was grieved with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart. They've not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath they won't enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily. This is something we should be teaching each other, exhorting each other in every day while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened. There it is again. Hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we've become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. This has got to be like the third time we've heard him say this. Verse 16, for who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Chapter 4, keep going. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well to them. So remember we said if the gospel could just get preached to them, if they just heard the gospel, if they just heard the gospel, and he's writing here saying, they heard it. They heard it just like you heard it. But they didn't enter in to rest. They didn't enter into the promise of God. Indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as it was to them. But the word which they heard, everybody say heard. 
it did not profit them. Or in other words, it didn't do for them what God wanted it to do for them. The Word didn't do in their lives what the Word wanted to do in their lives, what the Word was willing to do in their lives. What He was willing to do, He was not able to do. Now this right here flies in the face of religion. Because religion has been diligent to teach us we know that God is able, we just don't know if He's willing. But that's not the truth. The truth is God is willing. Always has been willing, always will be willing. And He is willing to save, to heal, to deliver, to set free, to, to prosper, to be good to men and women today the same as He was since Jesus. His willingness is there. But you have to ask yourself, is he able in my life? There is something that keeps God's hands tied in our lives. He couldn't do for them. It couldn't profit them. Why? It wasn't mixed with faith in those who heard it. For the sake of our time together, what would you say? They heard it, but they didn't respond to it wasn't mixed with faith. There wasn't a faith response to what they heard. That's why it says in verse 3, we have believed to enter into that rest. As he said, so I swore in my wrath, they will not enter my rest, although the works were finished before the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Verse 6, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Verse 7, Again, he designates in a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, it has been said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Okay, are you still with me? Don't bail out on me yet. This is about to get good. I want you to hear this. Did you notice how many times over and over he said, Do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. When you hear it, don't harden your heart. The reason these people, who's he talking about? That first generation of the children of Israel that God delivered out of Egyptian bondage. You remember this, right? I mean, this is one of the first things you heard about in children's church. Moses and God delivering the people out of Egypt. And if you remember anything about it, God did it and he wasn't subtle about it. You remember that? God did not sneak these people out of town. No, it was plague after plague after plague, and there was about a bazillion flies and about a bazillion frogs, and there was frogs in the bed, and there was frogs on the table, and there was frogs in their clothes, and this thing went on and on and on, and, that, and all the water turned to blood, and it just over and over and boils, and it got to the place where the firstborn of all the Egyptians was killed in the night. This was not subtle. God went over and above with one motivation, which was to bring his people out and to rescue them. And if you go back and look in the, this account in the book of Exodus, what was it that got God's attention in the first place? If you look at it, really the only thing the scripture says is the people cried out. They cried out, and that's it. And God heard it. If you look up that word cry, it just means it was a cry for help. And you know what's interesting about that is it doesn't sound like there may be a lot of faith in that. But if all you know to do is say, God, I need your help. You know what that is? Humility. Because pride says, nah, I got this. Pride says, no, I can handle this. I got this. I don't need your help. I got this. But faith even if you're crying, let it be in faith. I need your help. I don't got this. I don't have this. I put it in your hands. I need your help. And God heard that cry. And he responded to their cry. And then you know what he did from there. And he brought these people out. But something happened once they got out and God told them, hey, I've got this land for you. Go take it. It's yours. It belongs to you. And they wouldn't do it. 
And over and over and over again, they fought with God. They fought with Him. It says they would not enter in. This land was their resting place. They wouldn't enter into it because they heard it. They heard the good news. It's yours. I've, I've got it for you. It belongs to you. They heard it. That's great. But they didn't respond to it. They didn't respond to it. And because they didn't respond in faith to it, they never entered in. Their hearts were hard. Their hearts were hard. Thank you, Lord. In verse 6, it says, they did not enter because of their disobedience. This is an interesting word. If you look it up, it comes from a word that means unpersuadable. Unpersuadable. Let me just stop right here for a minute. Can I just tell you something about me real quick? I feel no pressure whatsoever to perform for you. And it tries to come on as preachers. It tries to come on us. We want to work the people up, you know. We want to get something out of you. But I, I've come to grips with the fact that if you say amen, it's not you responding to me. It's you responding to the word. Now, I might help you with it. I might say, come on, say amen. I might say, come on, get, it, get on board with this. But all I'm trying to do is encourage you to respond, not to me, to the word. To the word. And as preachers, sometimes, I, I, and I've yielded to it. I've yielded to the pressure to perform and to get up here and to shout till sweat's running out of every pore of my body, till my shoes are filled with sweat and then I feel like I've done something wrong. And you know something? It's children that require entertainment. You can't hold their attention. You can't hold a child's attention unless it's... And it's cute when they're kids, right? You know, you work it up. You, you, children's church people are, God bless them, man. I don't know how. What's not so cute as a 45, 55, 65-year-old man of God sitting up in this place, dozing, checking out, because this isn't entertaining enough. Sorry. But I'm saying this out loud, not just for your sake, but for mine. I feel no pressure to perform for you. Because it's not me you're responding to. And it's not me you're not responding to. As a matter of fact, if we had time, we'd go look at it. But this whole account he's talking about, you can read about it in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 12, 13, 14. God spoke to Moses and said, I want you to send guys out there and tell them to spy out the land. Everybody say the land. Yeah. Spy out the land. And he said, you'll see. You see what a good land it is. So Moses called together some spies, and he said, I want you to go spy out the land. But then Moses added some things to it. He said, I want you to go spy out the land, and I also want you to see if there's an enemy there. See what the people are like. See what the walls are like. See what the place is like. God never said anything to him about spying out who was there. He said, go look at the land. So he did. He sent out the spies, and they came back two by two. You remember this? And every one of them but two came back and said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good land, but, but we can't take it. The descendants of Anak are there. Oh, really? Anak. Oh, yeah, Anak. They're really, really tall. <laughs> no, like really tall. Super tall people. And, and you know what else? Walls. It's got walls. So can't go take that land. And Joshua and Caleb, like, looking at each other, looking at these guys, and they said, y'all shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. 
Caleb speaks up and he says, folks, listen to me. We are well able to go take this land. And you know what? Remember what God said? They didn't go in. Why? Because their hearts were hard. Their hearts were hard. Have you ever been talking to somebody and just felt like you couldn't get through? You just felt like, man, I know what I said was right. I believe it. I'm convicted of it. I've got evidence for it, but I just don't feel like I can, I can get through to them. I'm trying, but I just can't get through. I just can't get through. I just can't get through. You want to know why you feel like you can't get through? It's because you can't get through. <laughs> That's what a hard heart is. You look it up when he said it over and over. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. It means calloused. It means unfeeling. It means insensitive. Right on the other hand, if you've got a soft spot somewhere on your body, maybe a bruise or some place that's been affected, you ever notice that you have to just barely touch it at all? And you get a reaction, don't you? Somebody comes across, let's, let's say it like this, you've been laying out in the sun. Let me talk to the white people for just a second. You've been laying out in the sun and you laid out there and you fell asleep. And you laid out a bit too long, and you're a different shade coming in than you were going out. And it, that skin's all sensitive, right? And you gingerly put your shirt on. It's all red and maybe even a little blistered. And you put that on, and you come to church, and somebody says, Hey, brother! <laughs> Slaps you across the back. Ah! Ah! What's wrong? What's wrong with you? Why such a response? Because it's sensitive, it's tender, you feel it. How hard does God have to press to get a response out of you? Because you can get to the place where your heart's so hard and calloused, you don't feel anything anymore. And God said, that's the problem with these people. I preached the gospel to them. I told them the land was theirs and it was good. But their hearts were so hard, I couldn't get them to go in. I couldn't get them to take courage. And you know what the scripture says? They cried. And they cried. And they cried. Now, wait a second. They cried just a while before that, and God went to work for them. What's the difference now? The difference now is God has done some things for them. The difference now is God has proven himself to them over and over and over. And he's done it in magnanimous, huge ways. Ways that the whole world saw it and would hear about it. He proved himself, not only in delivering them out of Egypt, but in the way he led them through the wilderness. Folks, it was raining bread. They ate every day, and it was nothing short of a supernatural demonstration of a miraculous God and his love for his people every single day. Food on the table, food in their stomachs. Every day, there was a cloud leading them. Every night, there was fire. And still, when it came time to take the land, they were hard. Hard in their hearts and wouldn't go in. Still crying, 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 crying. I noticed this about our little girl. She's the younger of our two. Her name is Jessie Grace. And when she was very small, she's four years old now, but when she was very small, I noticed something about her. This little girl would cry like babies do when she got hungry. Nothing unusual about that. That's what they do. And when she got to the point where after mama's not nursing her anymore, we're feeding her solid food, and we put her in the high chair, and we strap her in, and we feed her. Why? She's crying. She's hungry. And you know what? We fed her every day, multiple times a day. We never missed a meal. Why? We love her. Okay? That's why we feed our children. We love them. But I noticed something about Jessie. Even after we would put her in the high chair, even after she was strapped in, even after we had begun to feed her, you know what she would do? she would cry between bites. She'd cry between bites. 
In other words, she's sitting there strapped in and there's food in her face and she's like, ah, and stop crying long enough to take the bite. Ah! Start crying again, feed her, she'd stop. Feed her, she'd stop. Bite, stop. Start her crying again. Stop when you take a bite, cry again. It was, so, it was hilarious to me. She's crying between bites. And I got to laughing about this and then I hear the voice of the Lord and he says, you know, I wish you'd stop crying between bites. How many times have I fed you? And you would think that our children would start to get the point, right? Baby, we fed you like moments after you were born and we haven't stopped yet. And day after day, week after week, month, years go by. We've never missed a meal. We have fed you every time you got hungry. And the idea is that she gets used to that and she becomes accustomed to that and she can depend on that and she gets to the point where she doesn't have to cry for it anymore. But you would think that you'd get the point. If you're sitting there with a spoon in your face, you don't have to cry anymore. Food is on its way. But yet she would cry between bites. I wonder how many people, how many of us are doing God the same way. He has fed us. He has provided for us. He has demonstrated himself and his goodness toward us over and over and over and over. And you would think that we would grow up a little bit and realize that when we're strapped in, it's feeding time. When it's as tight as it's ever been, you would think that instead of crying for it, we would just think back on how good he's already been and not respond to the hunger, but respond to the faithful father. Folks, when you're strapped in, it's feeding time. But don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart, the scripture said. You notice what it said in Hebrews about it. God saw a hard heart a hard heart is an unresponsive heart. One, like he, uh, the book of Ephesians talked about, told us not to walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Why? Because their minds are darkened, he said, and their hearts are blind and hardened. And he said they are past feeling. In other words, they don't feel it anymore. You know, you can get to a place where something that used to affect you something that used to captivate you doesn't even have any kind of effect on you anymore. On our first anniversary, my wife and I went on a vacation to Hawaii. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. Breathtakingly beautiful. As a matter of fact, the only other place I've been to me that comes close and may in many ways surpass it is Cape Town, South Africa. And I think to myself, when I'm in Hawaii or I'm in a place like Cape Town and I'm looking at these mountains and I'm looking at this ocean and I'm looking at Table Rock and the way the clouds just pour over the top, this just takes your breath away. And I'm looking at it and I, I stop for a moment and I look at the people who just live life there. I think about kids who were born there and have never been anywhere else. And you gotta ask, do you even know? Do you even realize what beauty, what awe you are surrounded by every day of your life. Do you know you can get this way with God? You can become so desensitized that what used to strike awe and wonder in your heart, now you sit in the middle of it and say, is this almost done? I'm hungry. When are we leaving? Be careful. You're getting in conversation with the wrong thing. He's looking for a response. He wants a response. There's more we could say about this, but I want you to see this in closing. New Testament scripture, go to the book of Mark chapter three. I know some of these things are sobering, but we need to see them, we need to understand. He's waiting on us to say something. In Mark chapter 3,
beginning in verse 1, it says, Jesus entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Verse 3, it says, He said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Then he said to them, the people watching him, he asked him a question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? See, Jesus knew what was going on. Here he is on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, which is the day of rest. It's the day that God rested. He didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because he was done. And if you go back and look at creation, do you remember what God said about each day when he got to the, it, to the finish of it? He looked at it and said, it is good. It's good. It's good, he said. Day one, it's good. It's good. He got all the way through to day six and said, it's good. Do you want to know what he said about day seven, Sabbath day? He said, it's holy. It's not good. It's holy. It's the only day God called holy holy, sanctified, set apart, that day of rest, that day when all the work is finished, all the good work is done. You rest. You enter in to the rest. Now, why didn't the Hebrew children enter in to the rest? Their hearts were hard, disobedience, unbelief, unpersuadable. This is one of the most dangerous places you can find yourself in your relationship with God is when you become unpersuadable. The children of Israel were unpersuadable and they had seen miraculous things. They had seen God deliver them out of Egypt. They had seen him, like we said, made it rain food and he split the sea and they walked across on dry land and their enemies drowned in the sea and there was fire at night and a cloud in the day. They had seen these things and still they come up to the land and they're still not convinced that God would do it for them. That's a hard heart. And because of their hard heart, they died out in the wilderness and they wouldn't enter into the rest. And it, Scripture says it grieved him. He was angry about it. You want to know what makes God angry with you? What makes God grieved with you? When you won't let him do what he wants to do for you. So frustrating when you have all the ability, all the power it takes within your hand to fix it right now. And they won't let you. They keep you at arm's length. Hard heart keeping you distant. It grieved him. It angered him. Because they wouldn't respond to him. They wouldn't enter into the rest. That Sabbath rest. Jesus said to the man in verse 3, with the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath, on the day of rest, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Jesus asked them a question. I want you to notice what the scripture says. But they kept silent. They kept silent. What is that? No response. Jesus asked them a question and they didn't respond. There is no greater form of dishonor, I believe, than to look somebody in the eye who has just spoken to you and to treat them as though their words weren't even worthy of falling on your ears. Dishonor, no respect. You don't like it when your teenager does it, do you? You do you. You don't like it when you come in the room and they're sitting there in front of that television and you start giving them something to do and they turn the head towards you. I call it TV face. They turn the head towards you, but the eyes stay on the TV. The words are hitting their ears, but they're not listening. And you don't stand for it because that's not honor. That's not respect. They kept silent. 
Jesus looked at them and spoke to them and asked them a question, and they kept silent. I want you to notice the response that he had. When he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their heart. Same response that God had to the children of Israel, Jesus had to these people here this day. But he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now this man responded. What did he do? He stretched it out and his hand was restored as the other. Where did his healing come from? It came in the response. I'm so thankful that man was not intimidated by the people he was in the presence of that day. There was a pressure there to not respond to the word. I don't know if you've ever been around that before, but you hear something and something inside you wants to respond to it, but you start looking around. Are other people, are other people raising hands? Are other people worshiping? Are other people saying anything about this? There's a pressure to stay silent. Don't just, don't just, you know, look that over. That, that's Satan himself at work trying to keep you from what God wants to put in your life. He's waiting on you to respond to it. And every one of those religious people there that day could have been healed, could have been delivered, could have been set free, but they chose to not respond to what his question was. But where did this man get his healing? When Jesus said, stretch out your hand, he stretched it out. All he did was respond. In just a few moments, we're going to leave the air. But I want to say something to those of you watching this broadcast. Just because you're there and you might be alone, don't think you're ruled out. Respond to this. Say something. Whatever Jesus is asking you to do, if you're in need of healing, respond. He said to this guy, step forward. Step forward. Do it. Whatever he's instructing you to do, respond to it. Respond to him. Your miracle is in your response. Thank you, Lord. Would you stand on your feet with me in the congregation tonight? Let's worship the Lord together. Let's worship the Lord. I wow, Jen, what, what a night tonight. I mean, just the presence of God through His Word. Hasn't it just been amazing? It's been, it has literally been like the Word says, when we've received the washing of the water of the Word, it has just washed over our souls. It's refreshed us. It's reminded us of the true meaning of faith. The conversation that we have with God when He gives us grace and we respond in faith. And I believe that this message has been so touching even to you. You may have just felt in your heart that you just have this hardened heart and you have become callous towards the things of God. Tonight was your night to be able to say, no more, Lord, no more. This is my time to respond to you in the right way. Instead of whining or crying or complaining, rather to say, yes, Lord, thank you, I receive. If you have not yet made that decision, do it right now. Just open up your heart wherever you are right now and just say, Lord, today's the start of something new. I, I felt this, Jen, at the beginning of the meeting, that each and every one of us needed to come to that place of something fresh, something new, that we'd be able to stand strong. That's what Stand Strong Week is all about. It's about us getting into the heart of God, His Word for us to be able to restore us, to be able to get us to that place of freshness. And I trust that that's what this meeting has blessed you with today as well. Absolutely. And again, it just feels like such a rest, Andre. Yeah. There's, there's no um, need for performance. There's no need to be stirred up. The bottom line is the Word of God does all of that for you. It's a transforming work that He does on the inside of you. Yeah. All you have to do is respond to it. That's what it's about, responding to his word of grace to you. This is probably the best way that we could bring the word across to you in a way that you can apply it personally and practically to your own life and learn how to respond to his grace by faith. Thank you for being with us. Our time is out. We're going back to normal programming. This has been a live broadcast all the way from River Park 
East London, Studio B, right down here in the great city of East London, South Africa. We trust wherever you've watched the program from across the USA, uh, anywhere in the United Kingdom or across Africa, you've been blessed. Let us know what a blessing this program has been. And remember, tomorrow night, we're going to be back with you one more time, 7 p.m. Central African time. God bless you. Be constantly, he said, engaging in the contest of faith. Your faith ought to be on something all the time. You are the number one candidate in the earth today that all of heaven is waiting for.